Welcome everyone to my online course for research methods in psychology. My name is Frank Lociavo and I am your instructor. I have just a few quick things to discuss with you, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In this chapter, we've been discussing sources of information, and we've learned that scientific journals publish the most current, the most prestigious, and the most cutting-edge peer-reviewed research reports. I mentioned that it's a joy to read a good journal article. Although that's true, I failed to mention that journal articles often contain lots of detailed information. And that can be overwhelming, particularly to students who are just beginning to learn about research methods. So, in this video, I'll show you how to read an empirical journal article. As you'll see, most journal articles are structured with the same six sections. I'll describe each section. I'll also show you a few strategies for reading articles quickly and efficiently. As you'll see, you don't necessarily need to read every word of every article from beginning to end. Sometimes it helps to skip around. I'll show you what I mean. All right, let's get to work. I mentioned that empirical journal articles can be overwhelming, but they can become much more manageable after you discover they're all formatted in essentially the same way. That's because most psychology journals publish articles that have been written in APA style. APA style is outlined in the Publication Manual of the American Psychological Association. The Publication Manual provides authors with a standard format for writing empirical articles. And that standard format is typically composed of six primary sections. An abstract, an introduction, a method section, a result section, a discussion section, and a section for references. Generally speaking, that's it. You'll often see additional subsections, but for the most part, you can expect to see each one of those six sections in every empirical article that's written in APA style. That's a good thing, my friends. This type of standardization helps you know what to expect from a journal article. It also helps you find specific information quickly and easily. For example, if you just want to know which sources the author cited, you'll always find a complete list in the reference section. If you just want to know what the authors measured and how they measured it, you'll always find that information in the method section because that section describes the specific research methods the authors used. Furthermore, this type of standardization is helpful when it's time for you to write your own research report. Think about it. You've probably never written an empirical research report, but even before you begin, you'll already know that your research report will be broken down into six primary sections, an abstract, an introduction, a method section, a result section, a discussion section, and a section for references. Trust me, knowing how to structure a research report is half the battle in writing a research report. All right, let's look at each section in a bit more detail. We'll use Milgram's article on obedience as an example. After reading the title of a journal article, the abstract should be the first section you read. And read it carefully because a well-written abstract will do a great job of summarizing the entire article. Really, it should be packed with lots of great information. For example, in Milgram's abstract, we can see that his research consisted of a laboratory study in which subjects were ordered to use a shock generator we can see that the primary dependent variable was the maximum shock a subject was willing to administer. And we can see that 26 of 40 subjects were fully obedient. We learned all that, and we're just halfway through the abstract. When I read an article, I write notes to myself in the margins. In this case, I'd probably note that this was a laboratory study of what Milgram called destructive obedience, in which subjects thought they were administering electric shocks. When you conduct a literature search for a big project, you might find dozens of articles to sift through. A few handwritten notes will help you identify and remember what's special about each article. By the way, beneath each article's title, you'll almost always see the author's name and affiliation. At this point, Milgram was still at Yale University. He later moved to Harvard. And somewhere on the first page of the article, there's usually a brief source listing. So, for example, this shows that Milgram's article was published in the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology in 1963, in volume number 67 of the journal, 
issue number four on pages 371 through 378. That information would come in handy if you cited this article in your own research report, because you would need to include the article's publication information in your own reference list. Okay, let's move on to the next section, the introduction. The introduction section serves as the official beginning of the story. In addition to seeking the truth, our job as researchers is to tell the story of our data. Well, good stories always begin with some context, such as a little bit of background information. For example, this section allowed Milgram to explain what obedience is and how it relates to real-world events, such as the Holocaust, where millions of innocent Jews were killed. This section provided Milgram an opportunity to establish why his research is important. Milgram's introduction is relatively short and sweet, although you might have noticed that he included a subsection where he briefly explained the general procedures he used in his laboratory experiment. Although most authors leave those details for the next section, it's up to the author to decide what's necessary in any particular section. For example, some authors list their hypotheses at the end of their introduction. Sometimes those hypotheses make sense only when readers have a general understanding of the experimental procedures. Do you always need to read the entire introduction section? Not necessarily. If you're unfamiliar with the topic, in this case, obedience, then it's probably smart to read the introduction and learn as much as you can about it. But if you're already an expert on obedience, then you're probably safe to skim the introduction section and then move on to the next section, which is the method section. The method section is my favorite section of an APA style research report because it describes exactly what the researchers did. In fact, it should provide enough detail so that other researchers can replicate the procedure and then analyze their own results. That's a heavy burden, so it's important that the method section be meticulous, very clear, very precise. It needs to explain step-by-step step exactly what the experimenters did and exactly what the experimenters measured. As you can see, Milgram included subsections that discuss the subjects involved in the experiment, the personnel who worked with the subjects, and the location of the experiment. Let me switch views so you can see more of the article. As you can see, he also included a subsection that described the experimental procedures in minute detail. And a section that explained exactly what he measured. In other words, he identified and discussed his dependent measures. When it comes to an empirical research article, there's really no section more important than the method section. So as I'm reading an article, I couldn't imagine skipping it. Think about it this way. If you're not interested in reading what the researchers did during their study, then why are you reading their research report in the first place? As a novice researcher, you should read as many method sections as possible. Along the way, you'll learn how professional researchers design their studies. As you become more skilled designing research studies, you'll be able to study more and more complex facets of human thought and behavior. Long story short, pay close attention to the method section. I mentioned that no section of an empirical article is more important than the method section. That's true, but no section is more exciting than the results section. We conduct research studies so we can find out the results, right? We conduct research so we can find answers to our questions about human thought and behavior. So it makes sense that the results section contains this information, whether that information is quantitative or qualitative. Milgram was interested in discovering how many of his subjects would be fully obedient, which in this case meant shocking an innocent person with 450 volts of electricity. He began his results section with a subsection entitled Preliminary Notions. Those are basically his preliminary thoughts and ideas. In that section, he mentioned that people who were informed about his study predicted very few subjects would be fully obedient. As you know, they were wrong. In the next subsection, he shared his primary results. Sometimes the results section is very straightforward. For example, Milgram's analyses were easy to understand. 
As you can see, he shared a frequency distribution showing that 26 of his 40 subjects were fully obedient, delivering what they believed to be 450 volts of intense shock. That's a scary result, but it's easy to understand the statistics he used. Sometimes you'll encounter a results section that is complicated, possibly too difficult for you to understand at this point in your career. That's okay, really, it's okay. As you learn more about research and more about statistics, you'll better understand complicated results. For now, I have some advice. Just roll with it. If the authors describe a complicated analysis and they say it provides evidence that men and women were equally likely to be obedient, then just take their word for it, at least for now. Yes, we do want to scrutinize all key information and we don't want to blindly accept what others tell us, but we need to be reasonable given our current skill set. And for now, it's reasonable to accept the results as they're reported and to seek more clarification when necessary. My friends, conducting a research study is a big deal. So near the end of an article, it's nice to summarize what you've discovered and try to make sense of what it all means. That's what the discussion section is for. As you can see, Milgram got right to the point noting that two findings were especially surprising, with one being the sheer strength of the obedience he discovered. In this section, authors typically revisit their hypotheses. Although Milgram didn't state any formal hypotheses, he did mention that people ordinarily obey authority figures. In this sense, the data support his predictions. As I mentioned previously, Milgram's results were relatively straightforward. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's possible to explain results in a variety of ways, and those alternative explanations render the findings somewhat less convincing. If that's the case, for example, if confounds exist in the experimental design, or if reasonable alternative explanations exist for the results, then those issues should be raised in the discussion section. The discussion section is also a great place to suggest ideas for future research. By the way, here's a little secret. When researchers suggest ideas for future studies, that often means they're working on those studies already. Science is a wonderful thing, and it often turns into a race between researchers to find the truth. The final section of an empirical research article is the references section. As you've probably guessed, you won't read the reference section in the same way that you've read the other sections of the article. Although the sources in a reference list are important for writing a story, the reference list isn't really part of the actual story at all. That said, reference lists can be invaluable, particularly if you're a researcher who studies a similar topic. For example, Milgram might have found key sources that I'm not familiar with. When you conduct a literature search, sources often fall through the cracks. Somehow, you just might miss them. So when you read published research articles, you often stumble upon some really good sources. For example, if I study authoritarianism and I haven't read these two sources that Milgram cited, I might want to find them ASAP because those sources might help me with my own research. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because I'll have more to say about research methods in the next video.